Hey everybody, this is Hercules Penix, founder, curator, docent, and gift shop employee of the Hercules Penix Academy of Comic Book Studies. Today we're going to be looking at Devilina 1 and 2. Um, these were published by Atlas Seaboard, uh, late 1974 and early 1975. This was their attempt to go head-to-head -head with uh, Vampirella Warren's successful magazine. Um, Devilina was uh, going to be the heroine slash horror host of the comic and obviously wasn't as successful as Vampirella. It does promise illustrated stories of female-filled fantasy, which uh, I do prefer my fantasy to be female-filled, so that's quite enticing. But uh, there's some great, great stuff in some of these and uh, kind of a shame it didn't go on longer. First issue starts off with a beautiful color a cover by this guy named Pulo Har. Couldn't find anything about the guy, though I would gamble that he's Spanish. Um, not just because I'm half Spanish myself, but I do, I am kind of biased. And I do think in the 60s, 70s, the Spanish artists were some of the most outstanding artists in the world. Esteban Morato, all those guys are just amazing. And, uh, this is an incredible cover. Look how photorealistic this woman's drawn. That's pretty incredible. These jungle cats. And this guy, dude, this wicked warrior dude. That is, I don't even know what's going on with this head, headdress and his helmet. It's, it's pretty cool. Apparently this cover was flipped, the art, and used as a Vampirella cover a few years later. So I don't know. Vampirella number 111, it said. Kind of weird. Contents page. This is strange. The um, editorial page here is seems to be the editorial page from Weird Tales of the Macabre, which was the creepy, eerie to uh, Devilina's Vampirella, published by Alice Seaboard. So it is talking about both titles, but it mentions how uh, talks about the Jeff Jones cover. And that's not on this. That, that's on Weird Tales of the Macabre number one. Also, this is really interesting. Uh, the title of this wasn't even Devilina. It was Tales of the Sorceress. I guess it's the very last minute before it went to press. After this was written, they changed it to Devilina to be more uh, Vampirella-ish. And to push the, like, the, the sexy uh, horror host more. So we start off with the Devilina's origin. Satan's Domain is the name of the story, with story and art by Rick Estrada. Rick Estrada, I hated this guy as a kid. He's kind of got the stylized, cartoony style, but now I really like it. He did a lot of DC War stories that are, totally look different than anything else, you know, in mainstream comics. His style is very unique, and as an adult, I kind of like it. So we start off with the biblical story of, you know, Lucifer... Uh, revolting against God, being cast down to hell, and becoming Satan. But then they add something that I've, is, I'm pretty sure is not part of any Christian mythology, not even Apocrypha. So um, Satan's mother, Sephora, comes down to hell after he's uh, ascended to the throne. She's got a little infant in her arms, and she says, this is your sister, Devilina. And it's weird because Satan seems kind of to have a little shred of uh, decency. He says, you can't stay here. I, I shan't allow the corruption and evil of this place to touch you or the child. So he sends her back to earth, um, sets her up in this mansion on the New England coast. And he says, raise her there, teach her the ways of necromancy. And the mother says, I don't want you interfering with her childhood. And Satan's like, fine. But you know, Satan is the prince of lies, so. So she grows up um, a normal childhood, relatively normal. She's uh, very intelligent, cute as a Dickens, but all the other kids don't like her in school because weird things seem to happen when she's around. They throw this ball at her and it, the ball turns to ash. So uh, she can't help her birthright. So when she turns 18, her mother basically uh, tells her about her heritage and, you know, who she is, really. 
Also, these horns grow on her head. And it's kind of weird because throughout the comic, these horns come and go as they please. Sometimes they're very prominent and obvious, and then they're just not there. I don't understand what that's all about. So basically, your mother's like saying, you know, you've got to fight your brother, Satan. And definitely is like, no, I want to go to college. I want a normal life. So the mother agrees or gives in and says, well, at least take this chest, this trunk. It contains the costume, the ring, the belt, and the sword that may someday protect you. So she goes off to college, meets her roommate. And that night, two demons from hell abduct her. They take her down to see Satan. And Satan has seemed to change his mind. He's kind of like, uh, I want you to join me down in hell. You can enjoy all the forbidden pleasures down here. It's it's great down here. And he's like, no, nah, I don't want any anything to do with this. So he sends her back to Earth. But he says, I'll be keeping my eye on you. So four years pass. She gets a degree in journalism, specializing in occult reporting, which I don't think any college offers that. Um, she's pretty happy because uh, her her uh, crush, Ron, invited her to the graduation ball. And at the ball, they're just instantly connecting. They're making out. She's pretty much in love with him already. And Ron is lighting a cigarette for Devolina's roommate. And when he goes to put the match out, this satanic fire envelops him and spreads throughout the gymnasium. Satan is seen in the background laughing. Devalina uh, summons a, a storm, a rain cloud with her magic powers. And it puts out the fire in the gymnasium and she saves the day. I really like this effect, how he does the rain cloud. It looks like charcoal or something. It looks kind of cool. So she does save the day, but not Ron. Ron dies of third degree burns. He's the only casualty. And she hears her brother laugh, laughing and hears his voice saying, you shall destroy anyone you love, Devalina. Love is for humans and you are not human. So Devalina goes to that trunk and uh, puts on her devil bikini and her, has a crazy curved sword and she vows to punish Satan for what he's done. And we'll find out more about that next issue. This next story is, uh, story is called The Lost Tomb of Nefertiti. Written by Gabe Levy, uh, who did a lot of stuff for Atlas Seaboard. Never saw him outside of Atlas Seaboard, ever before or since. But the art is by Pablo Marcos. And this is some of the nicest Pablo Marcos art I've ever seen. Uh, he was a Peruvian cartoonist. Came to America when he was pretty young, or at least started working for America. And, um, oh no, he did come to America. Uh, his family moved here. And he uh, started drawing for all the biggies, Marvel, DC, Warren. He did a lot of stuff for Atlas. Man, look at this opening splash page. This montage is gorgeous. Some really sumptuous, beautiful art. So uh, the story starts out when the Sahara, we see these two archaeologists. And the older archaeologist says, so now we just got to wait for the x-ray team to arrive before we open the coffin because we don't want the mummy to crumble when it's exposed to air. We want to see what the status of, of it is. And this other guy is just like, why do we have to wait? We've been digging for six weeks. I don't want to wait any longer. And he says, sit back, just relax. I'll be here soon. And the guy picks up a pickaxe. He says, I can't wait anymore. And he kills the guy. Seems very um, out of character. Not that I know this character, just out of anyone's character who's ever lived. And because uh, he's very worried that this x-ray team is going to steal their find, you know. But the thing is, they're still on the way. So this doesn't solve anything. This this uh, plot is riddled with like really bad uh, writing. So he goes down into the tomb and he takes the lid off this casket and it's this female mummy. And by reading the hieroglyphics on the wall, he realizes it's the lost tomb of Nefertiti. So he continues to read the hieroglyphics and he finds out the whole story. We see a flashback to Egypt. 
Egypt is being ravaged by the plague that uh, Moses uh, sent down from the Hebrew God. And we see the Pharaoh here. Look how cut this guy is, man. He's a monster. And his queen Nefertiti. And he uh, says that uh, this is all due to Moses and his wizardry. And the court sorcerer says, actually, it's just a, you know, it's a, a natural infec infection spread by locusts. But the Pharaoh's like, no, it's the Hebrews. It's one of Moses' tricks. And he goes out ready to kill every Hebrew he, he can find. Man, some nice stuff in here. So a little while later, Nefertiti's like, what's taking him so long? And a soldier comes in and tells her that the Pharaoh is dead. And he collapses in the sorcerer's arms. She looks down on her hand and all of a sudden she's got the plague. She sees boils on her hand. The sorcerer says, Ramsey's instructed that if you should ever contract the plague, I mummify you alive so that a future day sorcerer might cure you. And so he does just that. And now back in the present, Nefertiti arises from her casket and she starts coming after the archeologist. And then all of a sudden she just drops down dead. No heartbeat, no, no breathing. And then all of a sudden he starts feeling unwell and he's got the plague. The plague, it's still alive. I should have waited for the x-ray. Benson was right, this isn't fair. And the tomb of Nefertiti is silent once more, quiet as it was for 3,000 years and will be perhaps for 3,000 more. Totally forgetting that the x-ray team is about to show up. <laughs> oh God. Also, I don't think an x-ray would be able to sense the plague in a casket. Just so many, uh, so much bad writing in this. But man, this Pablo Marcos art. God, I love this panel. This makes me wish that Atlas uh, continued and had a comic called She Mummy or something like that. It's just a really cool looking character. Two page house, house ad for all the new Atlas comics coming out by Ernie Colon. I used to stare at this a lot when I was a kid. Oh, this next one's a, a beauty. Lay of the Sea, story by Gabe Levy, art by Leo Duranona, the great Spanish cartoonist. This is some nice stuff. Uh, Leo Dur Duranona, we've seen him already in Epic Illustrated. He even had like a miniseries from Dark Horse in the 90s, I believe, late 80s, called Race of Scorpions. He's been all over the block, though. I think he did stuff for Heavy Metal, Warren Magazines. He's been all over. But man, love this cartooning. So we see, it's like about a hundred years ago, we see this dock and this mermaid comes out. I love the way he draws this mermaid. And she morphs into a normal human woman. She goes to this inn, this tavern, and uh, all these uh, sailors frequent this tavern. She picks up one of them and they leave. Look at this kind of nice stylized panel here. Really interesting. And... When she gets him alone, she turns back into a mermaid and she strangles him to death. So in the next few weeks, up and down the English coast, bodies are found mysteriously murdered, all bearing the same visage of horror and all with seaweed drawn tight about their necks. So we also find out that all these sailors shipped on the, um, on the Lena, they were all crew members and these two are the only ones who are left alive, except for this one called Andrews. So they suspect that Andrews is the one killing everyone. They, they don't know about a mermaid, you know? And so they vow to kill Andrews before he kills them. We cut away, we see Andrews. He's pretty much a drunk now. He can't get a job on any vessel. Nobody will hire him. So he just figures, I got nothing else to do but keep drinking. He also seems always traumatized by a memory though. And we have a flashback. We see the Lena out on, out on the ocean. The fishing crew one night 
hold up the nets and there's a mermaid inside. They take her back to the ship and they proceed to sexually assault her repeatedly and brutally over and over. It's horrifying. Andrews was the one on night watch. And so after night watch, he was exhausted and went to sleep. So he missed all this. When he wakes up, he comes into the room and is like, what, what are you perverted bastards doing? And he attacks them. He's like, filthy rapist scum, leave the poor thing be. He's the only one who has any sympathy for this mermaid. They just beat the shit out of him. Even the captain's in on it. The captain helped. And uh, he tells him he'll never get a job again on any vessel. You know, going against your mates like that. That's, uh, you don't do that. So after they've had their fun, they throw the mermaid back into the ocean. They don't kill Andrews because they figure nobody's going to believe his story anyway. So then we're back to the present and those two sailors from the Lena show up and they're like, hey, Andrews, there's a new ship in the harbor needing crew. You want to come sail with us? And he's he's like, yeah, sure. Thanks, guys. Of course, it's a ruse. They get in this rowboat and once they're out to sea, they, they're going to kill him. But then all of a sudden, these tentacles rise up out of the water. They belong to the sea serpent, and the mermaid is riding the sea serpent's back. And it quickly kills the two bad guys. And during the scuffle, Andrews is knocked out. The last thing he sees before he loses consciousness is the mermaid's face. And he wakes up in the rowboat near the dock. And for the first time in a long time, he's at peace. Justice has been served. So uh, this one's incredible. Uh, Midnight Muse, um, written by this guy, Michael Callan, who has no other credits, art by Ralph Reese. We've talked about Ralph Reese a bunch of times on this channel. Love this guy's work. Very unsung hero of comic books. And this, this is probably one of the slickest things I've ever seen him draw. This some of the illustration in here is just amazing. <clears throat> so the story starts out, we just see these weird like lettering of, I don't know, robotic alien lettering. Now, not yet. And then we see these two hippies in the city and look at the craft drawing these cars, the shading, it almost looks like photos. Man, there's chops on this guy. And this guy, Steve is like, telling his friend he's crazy. He's like, what are you talking about? And this guy, Mike, has got this whole paranoid theory that there's reasons why uh, events in life sometimes seem too coincidental, how sometimes you feel you're being watched. He believes that there's these controllers who uh, totally are in control of our destinies. And Steve is just like, dude, you sound crazy. You're being paranoid. That sounds nuts. But Mike is convinced. And they go in this diner and he tells Steve, he says, these creatures are going to kill me because I know too much. And we see once again, now, not yet. So Steve finally convinces Mike to just like, dude, go home and go to sleep. I mean, this is nuts. Look at the panels here. Pretty sure these are photo referenced. They're so good. So he's uh, walking out of the diner and we see these insectoid aliens now, yes, now. And all of a sudden these bright lights appear and Mike keels over dead. I don't know, some kind of alien beam. And Steve says, oh my God, Mike. And he's standing over the body. And then we see those alien voices now, not yet. Ooh, creepy. It almost seems like something that would be pretty good in an underground comic. Really a cool little uh, story. This next one, called, uh, next one is called Merchants of Evil. Story by Jan Albano. Did a lot of stuff for Atlas Seaboard. Also did stuff for the Marvel Black and White line in the 70s. And art by Jack Sparling. Old-timey cartoonist. Not that great. But whatever. He tells the story. Look at this. It's, this is the host of Weird Tales of Ma the Macabre. 
the sister magazine to Devilina. And I guess this was meant for that because the horror host is this guy. But at the last minute, they just had to scramble stories to make a deadline. So this uh, story is about Gerald Gorney. And he's this total practitioner of black magic. And, but everyone in the neighborhood knows him as uh, the sweet little guy who runs the pet shop. So he's interrupted during one of his rituals. It's the postman. And he gets out of his robes and he comes to greet him. I guess his pet shop is known far and wide for they have really exotic animals. Some of the animals uh, were thought to be extinct before he procured them. Nobody really knows how he can manage to do this. He uh, kind of convinces the postman to come in the back room and have a glass of sherry with him. And the postman's like, oh, I'm not supposed to, I'm on duty, but what the hell? And Gornley proudly shows off all of his like creepy black magic stuff, his altar, his gargoyles. And uh, the postman's kind of like, oh, this is weird. And he drinks his sherry. And then uh, Gordy starts telling him his whole theory about how animals uh, look like, I'm sorry, humans look like the animals that they were in their past lives. And he tells him, he's like, you know, actually, uh, I think you were a monkey in your past life. The way you walk, your, the facial features you have. He says, what kind of crack is that? And then he starts choking. And... Uh, he gets dizzy and he falls over. Even though he's conscious, he's paralyzed. And of course it was, uh, he put something in the sherry. And a few moments later, he kind of dissolves and reforms as this badly drawn monkey. <laughs> and he puts him in a cage. The next day, a beautiful woman comes to visit the pet store. He somehow convinces her to have a glass of sherry with him too. Same thing happens, except she becomes a bird of paradise. <laughs> Look at that hair. It's this quaff. Very silly looking bird. The next day, there's a big goon comes up to the door and without saying a word, just slugs him and proceeds to beat the shit out of him. Drags him into the back room. Says, I know my girl. My girlfriend came in here yesterday, never came out. I know because I got guys watching her. So he's some kind of mob guy and he finds her earring on the floor and he's like you bastard and he's like wait I'll tell you everything but just allow me to have a glass of sherry my heart if I have another attack I couldn't tell you anything so he says fine have your damn drink and I guess he convinces the guy to have a glass of sherry with him because a few minutes later he's walking upstairs to tend his wounds and wondering what kind of animal the mob boss is going to turn into. And he's like, he did seem to have a, a, a kind of a feline-like aspect to him. Maybe he'll come back as a, an Angora cat. And all of a sudden he hears this rumpus downstairs. All the animals are screaming. He runs down. All the animals are dead. It's like a panorama of grisly carnage. He describes it as. And then he hears a growl and he turns around. And it's a saber-toothed tiger. And he totally kills him. And the end came swiftly for a merchant of evil who had made but one misjudgment. I really like the way he draws that saber-toothed tiger. It's a nice panel. Unfortunately, I just, I totally forgot <laughs> this damaged copy. Some kid was trying to cut out this kung fu drawing on the ad here. We have an article about some vampire movies from the 70s. The Vampire Lovers. They're like English movies. And I guess there was some sequels. Lust for a Vampire. That's a pretty good title. Sammy Harkham should make a comic about it. So uh, this last one's kind of weird. Um... It's an adaptation of William Shakespeare's The Tempest, written by a crappy longtime DC writer, Martin Pascal, and art by Leo Summers. And uh, we saw him in one of those Wolf the Barbarian comics. Kind of very idiosyncratic style. Um, kind of sloppy, but I like his style a lot. Like 
Sometimes faces uh, panel to panel will just change, but he's got some serious chops. So it's interesting, they tell The Tempest as if it was a Warren comic. It's got like the second person narration. You study these two, the man who enslaves you and his lovely daughter these past 12 years. They have been trespassers on your tiny Mediterranean island home. So we, we see Caliban, he's the narrator. He's the monster in The Tempest. And Prospero is his captor. He's this powerful wizard and is, he has a daughter named Miranda. So he tell, tells Miranda that there's this horrible storm offshore. I think Prospero started it because this is no normal storm. We see meteors landing in the ocean. And apparently the ship, by some strange twist of fate, contains all of his enemies. But using his magic, he wants to make sure they make it to shore. And uh, we'll find out why. Love the way he draws Caliban, this kind of fish man. So he tells his daughter, Prospero tells Miranda um, how they got to the island. Prospero was the Duke of Milan. Um, his brother kind of stole his throne with the help of the King of Naples, who always hated Prospero. They cast him out into the sea on this little boat. And luckily they found this island years ago. And that's where she's grown up her whole life, most of her life. And then he summons his servants, Ariel, who's kind of like this magical sprite, and Caliban, the poisonous slave begotten by the devil himself. Prosper is not very nice to Caliban. So we see a little uh, flashback to Ariel's origin story. I guess he was being tormented by this witch Sycorax for years and trapped in this tree and uh, Prospero freed him with his magic. So Ariel is, uh, owes him his service. Some really nice art in here, man. Leo Summers could really uh, drop the hammer. Ariel doesn't like Caliban very much either. Nobody does. He's pretty much just this ugly wretch. I feel kind of bad for the guy. So apparently the island was his, was Caliban's. And then Prospero showed up. And then I, th I guess they were kind of neighbors for a while. Um, but one day uh, he saw Miranda bathing and uh, he sought to violate the honor of Pros of Miranda. So ever since then, Prospero has basically chained him and has enslaved him. He did te teach him language though, for which Caliban is grateful. So now we're down on the beach, the uh, Prospero's brother is there and the king of Naples, his two great enemies, and then the king's brother, Sebastian. Sebastian is this gorgeous Adonis of a man and Caliban is watching all of this. And as soon as Sebastian meets Miranda, they don't even know each other. They just run into each other's arms and kiss because they're both so you know beautiful. So sad, he's got this tear in his eye. Caliban's just like, eh. And then out of nowhere, well, out of the, from the ship, um, we see this uh, kind of like a jester by his uh, attire, I would guess. And he's drinking wine, he's totally drunk. And he meets Caliban and he shares his wine with him. And uh, Caliban has never drunk drunken wine before. And he, he says, you cannot know what mystic power the strange new liquid wields, but you can feel it cast its wondrous spell on your senses. So he's just like in love with wine. And he basically says, if you give me more of that, I'll promise to be your servant. And the gesture's like, sure, have another cup. So, you know, his tongue is loosened from the wine and he starts just talking about how Prospero, how cruel he's been to him. And he says, if you uh, kill my master for me, I'll be your servant for the rest of my life. 
And the jester agrees. He's like, oh, man, this Prosper sounds like a bastard. Yeah, I'll help you out. Unfortunately, Ariel is spying on them. And he makes a pit of quicksand to trap them in. But Caliban's really strong, so he pulls himself out, pulls the jester out. Ariel goes to Prospero, tells him how he's kind of a, a corralled his enemies from the shipwreck into this little lime grove. They're kind of trapped there awaiting Prospero's uh, judgment on them. So Ariel does this other trick where he kind of distracts Caliban and the Jester with these like magical look raiments, these clothes. And then Prospero shows up and sets these wolves at to uh, hound them. Prospero sees his brother. His brother says, the dukedom I resigned to thee and please pardon me. And Prospero does. And he forgives his brother and he says, we're all going to get on the, that ship, which has been magically, you know, uh, fixed up. And we're all going to sail back to Italy where I will become the Duke of Milan again. And before he leaves the island, he tells Ariel that he's free of his servitude, but he has to do one more thing for him. He says, he says, Caliban must be pinched to death, which is some kind of Shakespearean term. And then I love this crazy last panel. These weird little critters are just biting Caliban's body, just devouring him. As Calib Caliban thinks to himself, or the narrator says, you lost your heart to a beauty whose eyes were only for the handsome. And your last thought is that what is beautiful is not always true and that what is true is not always beautiful. Oh, that's Shakespeare. The wisdom of the ages. How true that is. So now we got Devilita number two. This cover is by this guy who I, I think never did anything else in comics. His name's uh, George Torjusson. Let me check that name out. Yeah. Now when I looked up on the internet, it's kind of sad. I guess he never did much of anything. Because his latest auction, I don't know, in the past 20 years, he sold a Elvis painting for $250. So I guess this guy didn't have much of a career, an art career. But um, it's kind of interesting, kind of like nephew art. Um, I like these weird little demons, almost kind of like funny looking. And it's, I gotta say though, this is really bizarre. I guess the other side of Devilina's cape has this silvery finish on it. And the way he draws that... Um, I don't know if it's airbrush or something. It is really cool looking. Maybe he was a, an airbrush uh, artist for did vans and stuff. Contents page. And we start off with Devilina once again. Once again, written and drawn by Rick Estrada. And man, his style got really different for this issue. It's very, it kind of reminds me of like, like he was reading a lot of Alex Toth or something. And I think as a kid, I saw some of the comics that were drawn like this by Estrada and I did not like it. This kind of stylized cartooniness, all these heavy blacks. Now I think it looks great. It's so fun, this cartooning. So the story starts off, oh, I should tell you the title. Devilina fights Corrupta in Curse of the Raw Scarab. So Satan sends one of his minions, Corrupta, up to uh, up to earth to uh you know fuck with his sister again so she comes to earth and she possesses the body of this editor of the village times in new york city meanwhile we see a bus heading for new york and it's devilina and her roommate they're both going to move to new york city to try to make it this bus driver that's <laughs> great so they get this nasty apartment in the village. There's roaches everywhere. So Devilina uses her powers to make him ams gray. And the next day she goes to get her job at the Village Times. That's why she moved to New York City. She got a letter in the mail. 
And we see Akulta as the editor. Of course, he gives her the job. She gives him the her the job because he's got a little plan. Look at this pen, all the black and the silhouettiness. That's cool stuff. So basically the plan is um, Devilina, her first assignment is to go to this museum where the raw scarab amulet is uh, first being shown or shown for the first time, I should say. And the big thing for the paper, the coup, um, the big scoop is they, uh, there's going to be a, one of their photographers there, Snap Kodiak, his name is. He's going to take a picture of her wearing the amulet. And uh, Devalina says, but that, there's supposed to be a curse attached to the amulet. And he says, there is, but we, we want to prove that it's hokum. Because, you know, we're skeptics here. We talk about occult stuff here at this newspaper, but we also, you know, disprove things, debunk things. So she agrees to do it. <laughs> God, how cartoony that is. So meanwhile, we see Satan, Satan gloating over his brilliant plan. And when Devilina puts this the amulet on, um, I guess uh, she'll be, become a slave to his will, will. But if you're human, if a human puts it on, it will melt their flesh. So the next day at the opening of this museum or this show, I love all these random people at the event. All very distinctive, interesting characters. I love that little statue too. And the museum director takes the amulet out and is about to put it on Devalina. And there's Snap Kodiak about to take the picture. And one of the rich socialites who donated a lot of money to the museum runs up and grabs the amulet and says, I should be the one to wear the amulet. I've donated a lot of stuff to this museum. And she puts it on and look what happens to her. I love that. That's really gruesome. It's so weird though. Snap is just saying, man, these are great pictures. And Devilina is like, keep snapping. We got ourselves a prize picture story. Like no sympathy at all for this woman. Who's melting. But then all of a sudden they do seem to have sympathy. They're like, ah, poor woman turned into a heap of molten protoplasm. So Devilina runs off to change into her uh, devil bikini and get her sword. And she's going to pay a call to Mr. Beckman, the editor, and find out what the hell's going on here. So she goes to his house, and right as she arrives there and peeks in the window, a, a corrupta is leaving the editor's body. So Devilina jumps in and confronts her. And they have a big, uh, a Donnybrook, a devilish Donnybrook. So Devilina gets the best of her and basically exercises her from our dimension. And we see her back in hell. Satan says, you failed me, but I'm going to give you one more chance. You have to go back to Earth. Now listen carefully. God, man, so much Alex Toth abstraction in these. So the, the editor wakes up from his possession. He's like, oh, what the hell are you doing here? She's like, oh, you got a little dizzy. I took you back to work. I'll see you tomorrow. And then we see back at her apartment, Corrupta is possessing her roommate, Penny. And the last panel, we see an evil glint in Penny's eye. And uh, we'll never find out what happened because this is the last sto story of Devilina ever published. Oh, this next one's a beaut. Vendetta, story by Jan Albano, but more importantly, art by Frank Thorne. And I've never seen Frank Thorne draw so tightly. You know, usually Frank Thorne's got that loose, breezy style, kind of Kubert-esque. Man, this is some nice stuff. It's almost like he was uh, reading a lot of John Severin that month and tried to, uh, I mean, it's not, it doesn't really look like Severin. 
It's not nearly as tight as Severin, but it is tight for Frank Thorne, and it looks great. It's still got the great looseness of Frank Thorne, but a little tightened up. Spectacular. So uh, this story takes place in the Old West. We see these uh, outlaw guys, Jeb and Roy, and they come upon uh, an Indian, a young Indian girl bathing. She's like 17. Roy uh, says, ah, she's too young, you know, let's leave her alone. He's like, to hell with that. She's ripe for the picking. Jeb's a true piece of shit. And he attacks the girl. And her little brother, who I guess was nearby, runs out and tries to rescue his sister. Roy just shoots him in cold blood right in his tracks. And he uh, drags the sister off to have his way. Sometime later, someone from the tribe finds the two dead bodies. Great panel there. I mean, almost every panel here is really nice. Some beautiful artwork. And it turns out these uh, kids are the children of the witch doctor of the of the tribe. And he vows vengeance. He says, I don't need any soldiers. I'm, I'm going to find these guys and get revenge. As he's riding off, the chief tells some of the other guys, he's like, you know, mutant magic that is used in anger carries its own seed of destruction. So he's kind of worried about the witch doctor. So now we see Jeb and Roy laughing about their, you know, Jeb is just laughing about his evil act. And in the middle of the night, they're woken up by this chanting. And Roy is really disturbed. Jeb is just like, eh, it's, who cares? It's just a bunch of wolves. And then we see the witch doctor doing this ritual. And he turns himself into a werewolf. He first gets uh, Roy. Kills Roy. Man, look at the gore on this. It's almost like his flesh has been vaporized from his bones. Like this wolf is just, the werewolf is just tearing him to shreds. It does seem like uh, the Atlas Seaboard black and white magazines were a lot more liberal than the Marvel ones. Like they show more nudity, more gore. Even the Atlas color comics themselves seem to do things that the comics code wouldn't allow usually. I don't know if Martin Goodman had some kind of pull with them or something. So Jeb starts chasing the werewolf. And he's uh, walking across a shallow pond and the werewolf pops up right in front of him. And quickly uh, kills Jeb. When the witch doctor uh, goes uh, to perform a second ritual to turn himself back into human, nothing happens. I guess he's... Uh, He's cursed now because he used his magic for evil. When he uh, he heads back to the village uh, and on the outskirts, one of the Indians shoot him, just happens to have a silver tip bullet and it kills him. He reverts to his human form and the chief says, perhaps death was his only escape from the demon's form he was imprisoned in. So many, oh, I love that panel too. Great stuff. This next one's called The Devil, The Devil's Procurus. And uh, I think this is, uh, yeah, this is John Albano and more art from Jack Sparling. Uh, they, they don't have credits half the time in these, uh, in this second issue. So we see this hospital, um, this demon baby has just been born uh, to this woman. And the older doctor who's worked there for a while isn't that shocked. The younger doctor's like, what the hell's going on? I can't believe what I just saw. And he's like, come to my office. I want to play you a tape. This will explain what's going on. So the tape is a uh, from a patient named Nancy Foster. She came there about a, a little while ago. 
And as we listen to the tape, she tells her story. She uh, tells the doctor when she first got there, she says, it was just over a year ago. Um, I was a newlywed, very happily married to my husband. And on our very first anniversary, he uh, passed out on the subway platform, fell right in front of a train and was killed instantly. So at the funeral, every, after everyone leaves, the owner of the funeral home, this woman, she comes out and she says, she says, yes, my husband was uh, taken from me as well. I suppose you'd do anything to re relive that year of bliss, wouldn't you? And she says, I'd offer my very soul. The old lady says, souls are bought rather cheaply these days, Mrs. Foster. However, if you were to offer something more attractive, you might be helped. And she informs her to come back to the funeral home at midnight. She does. And she makes a deal with the old woman. The old woman says, I work for powers that uh, demand certain things. So if you want this uh, to relive that year of marital bliss with your husband, you're going to have to give me something for my overlords. She uh, lifts the um, this trap door. And these horrible demons come out and begin to ravage her. They're just, they smell horrible. They're disgusting little creatures, like homunculi. And she puts up with it. That's her part of the deal. The next morning she wakes up. It's her wedding day. And she relives her whole year. But this time she has the knowledge that it's going to end on a certain day. And she counts the days. And... Is, you know, dreading that day. She decides to change fate. And she, uh, the night before her husband falls in front of the train, she's going to stay up all night and not go to sleep and be awake in the morning and tell him that she's sick and he can't go to work that day. She needs him to stay home, thus sparing his uh, life. But she falls asleep and the husband goes to work she gets the phone, same phone call from the police. So the older doctor ends the tape. And uh, he tells him that Nancy later learned she was pregnant and slowly went insane. I went to see that female undertaker. She moved away. Probably, probably to set up elsewhere and seduce other young widows. So the young doctor says, wait a minute, you actually mean to say that you believe this fantasy? One single abomination doesn't validate the story. It's just, a, this kid's a weirdo. And he says, yet we've had over 30 young women tell that same tale, Greg. And if it's proof you want, come with me and look down there. <laughs> and in this hospital, they have a holding pen for all the demon babies. Of, it's crazy. But uh, kind of like it, kind of like that story. I didn't see where it was heading, that's for sure. We have an article about Flesh Gordon, which is that uh, kind of soft core spoof of Flash Gordon. Came out around this time. Oh, this is amazing. The Prophecy by Suso. Um, I don't know his full name, but his, his pen name was Suso. Um, this guy was in a bunch of Skywald comics and uh, maybe one or two Warren magazines, but only a handful of stories. And it's so sad because this guy is so good. Look at this. Once again, another Spaniard. These Spanish guys know what they're doing, believe me. And uh, this is just gorgeous stuff. So we start off, this guy Chuck Weston goes to see this uh, fortune teller named Sybil. And she tells him his future doesn't look too good. In fact, it looks like he's going to die very soon. And a wolf will devour you. How about that for a fortune? So look at this panel right here. It kind of reminds me of young John Bolton. Even though the style is different, just the amount of like um, light and shadow, the way they play with each other and the very uh, 
John Bolton ish to me. So he leaves uh, Sybil's place. Look at that nice uh, building there. And uh, he's like, oh, that's absurd. He's thinking to himself. He's like, wolves don't attack human beings. And he goes to this tavern. And as soon as he opens the door, he sees this wolf head. But it's a dead wolf. Because there's this wolf hunter there. And the bar, the bar uh, tender tells the guy that, like, yeah, this guy's uh, kind of new to the area, this, this wolf hunter. He's killed, like, seven wolves in a week. So pretty soon we might not have to worry about wolves at all. So the bartender's talking about how the wolves have been getting a little too bold around that area. They, they've graduated from attacking sheep and goats to horses and cows. So people have started putting their animals into corrals every night to keep them safe. And the wolf hunter, as he leaves, he says, you know, that might not be the best idea. When you lock up your animals, what else can a hungry wolf attack but human beings? I like this just inset panel of... Uh, of a what's her face? God, I keep forgetting her name. I have to check. Sorry, Sybil. And uh, Chuck runs out before the hunter leaves, and he says, "I have a proposition for you. I'll pay you whatever you ask for if you'll be my bodyguard, and if you protect me from the wolves." So they're riding uh, to Chuck's house, and they're having, you know making conversation. And Chuck says, how come you hate wolves so much? And the hunter says, I don't hate wolves at all. Quite the contrary. I love and admire them. If I kill them, it's just to prevent, prevent a dangerous rivalry. And we see him change. Chuck is like, what do you mean? And he's like, you're a werewolf. I like this classic like Lon Chaney wolf man looking werewolf. And he jumps on Chuck and devours him. And then Sybil, as the narrator, says, no man can escape his destiny. Look at that. That's so well drawn. Man, it's so sad that Seuss only did, literally, it looks like he did like 10 comic stories, according to the Grand Comic Database. Not nearly enough. So this last story is called Night Creature. And this one is written by John Albano once again, and we get some more Leo Summers art. So it's olden times once again. And we see this young guy. He, uh, he's the assistant to the stable master at this uh, nobleman's estate, this duke's estate. The stable master happens to be his brother. He got him the job. So he's kind of in charge of the pigs and stuff, the lowly duties. And he's been starving this warthog for a while. And he guides him with this pitchfork into his brother's bedroom. And the warthog just gobbles up his brother. Look at this gore viscera coming out of his chest or stomach there. So everyone just thinks it's a horrible accident. And the Duke makes him the new stable master. Meanwhile, the Duke has got a daughter, Lady Elizabeth, and she just always like mocks him and teases him. So, uh, he basically, he's got this thing he always says. He says, my presence on earth will be remembered through all the ages. That's his ambition. He doesn't want to just be a lowly serf forever. He's going to make something of, of himself and people hundreds of years from now will know his name and his accomplishments. So she's really like totally likes teasing him. She even kind of comes in for a kiss, but he gets a little carried away and he starts pulling her dress off. And she says, listen, my father, he's returning. The Duke? So he kind of lets go of her. Man, look at this illustration. He is so good. And then she says, tee hee, how easy it is to outwit a silly goose especially a beggarly goose of common birth. 
So later that evening, Elizabeth comes back to taunt him some more and tease him. And he just cracks. And he rips off her dress and attempts to sexually assault her. And she says, no, I can't allow myself to be with child by a serf. And then right then the father walks in and he starts whipping him and thrashing him. And the stable master picks up a pitchfork and kills the Duke. He's quickly arrested by the household staff and sent to trial. Because of his age, he's not condemned to death. They send him to prison for the rest of his natural life. So when he arrives there, they all know what crime he did, of course. And he's like, says to them, uh, address me in the proper tone and manner. And they are just like, oh, fuck this guy. We are going to fuck with him. Thinks he's so, so high, highfalutin. So he says, throw him in the filthiest dungeon cell. And he says, wait, I have, I have not eaten since the morn. So they are just like, okay, fuck this guy. You're not getting any food and water. So they don't. So he's forced to survive on rats and bugs. And over the years, uh, I'm sorry, the months and, sorry, months and years, a mysterious change developed in his appearance. His two incisors began to grow longer and their ends more pointed. Man, that's a nice panel too. So one day, years after 11 years of incarceration, he escapes, uses his, he, he gnaws through the cell door with his teeth. Look at him, he's just such a horrific vision. The first thing he does is head right to his uh, former place of employment, the Duke's estate. And he climbs up this tower into Lady Elizabeth's bedroom. I see it's like Steve Bissett in some of this. Not necessarily style, but just their shading techniques. And just how gnarly it is. Like this guy looks like a gnarly enough to be a Steve Bissett character. So uh, he jumps at Elizabeth. She says, you can't, I have a husband now. And he says, that's perfect. He'll think it's his child. And afterwards he's had his way with her. He's running away. And he's th talking about how he needs recruits for an army. He's got all these uh, delusions of grandeur. But then he also says, this, this unquenchable thirst that scorches my throat, wetted by the few drops of blood I drew from Elizabeth's neck, because he bit her neck while he was having sex with her. I don't understand it. It consumes me, this need for the taste of warm blood. And then right then the villagers find him. And they tie him up and burn him at the stake. And he says, you can't do this. I'll be forgotten if I perish here. Forgotten by everyone. You know, his biggest fear. But without knowing it, history would record his infamous life. And that he would be always be remembered as the first vampire ever to walk the surface of the earth. So this is the unknown origin story of the very first vampire. And I guess if you eat a bunch of rats and bugs, you can be a vampire. So uh, I should tell, I wish Guillermo knew that on what we do in the shadows. It would be a lot easier for him. Great last panel though. I really like that story. Really interesting. John, John Albano was uh, one of the better Atlas writers. So there you have it guys. Devilina 1 and 2. I hope you enjoyed looking at them. Um, there's some definitely some great stuff in these two issues. And uh, also, I hope to see you next time here at the Hercules Pedics Academy of Comic Book Studies.